Hello, thanks for tuning in to another one of Umqua's signature tying sessions. My name is John Bond, and we are clocking into you just below the Arctic Circle here at our fishing lodge in Norway. We're going to be tying up a few of my signature streamer patterns, this one here being the dragon, formerly known as the beefcake back in 2012 when I invented it, and named it after Bruce Lee because this fly kicks ass. So, we're going to be going through a few of the different materials I use to create this fly and walking you through it step by step so you can do it yourself. Thanks for tuning in and let's rock and roll. to start this off we'll talk about the hooks a little bit to start off I'm going to be using a size 6 stinger hook for the tail and a size 2 for the head and upper body stingers just seem to keep the fish stuck to them a little bit better in my opinion so I've been using those for many years and I can resharpen them over and over again if I get caught up on a rock or a log or something like that so they They've always treated me well. Other materials we're going to be using cream marabou from Nature Spirit and some UV polar chenille silver and some sand colored Arctic fox on a wire brush. Now you can use a variety of different fox fur. You can also tie in a dubbing loop for the head or even just stack some in, but just user-friendly, ease of use, and good combination of UV and the right proportions of Arctic Fox. I love these brushes and that's really user-friendly for you at home. So we'll be going with some 210 denier Danville thread and this six number six stinger hook. And we'll start right at the top here. Work our way all the way to the bottom, right before the curve of the hook. And I'll just cover that hook real well with that thread all the way through, build up a good base so nothing slips. And I'll leave the thread just hanging there while I pick out a couple nice plumes of marabou. And for the tail, I like to use these little pieces that are more spread out and sparse. I usually use two pieces of this marabou for the tail to kind of stack it on top of each other and give it more body, more flow, more action. And I like these pieces because they, they almost look like a fishtail anyway at the very end. The, these tips just look good especially when they get wet. And they're also a little bit stiffer, so they, they swim good. So I'll take this marabou and I'll just slide it, slide my fingers all the way up to the tip, pinch the tip at a distance, maybe a little bit longer than what I'm going to use, and then place it just at the very top of the curve of the shank on that hook. And my placement, so, you know, I've got... Everyone's got their own little techniques when they tie their flies and, you know, points, points of interest or points to remember how far I use for different marabou or different sizes of marabou on certain flies. So I go just beyond my little bump here on my vise, maybe, you know, quarter to a half and an inch. It's better to have the tail a little bit longer so it gets more action than too short and then it just kind of floats through the, the water current like a dart instead of having some motion to it. So I place that piece of marabou just at the top of the curve there. Then I tie it in. My first couple wraps are a little bit loose because I like to kind of wiggle it and spread it around that hook so it kind of forms around that, that curve. And then I give it a couple heavy cranks, a couple tight wraps just to secure it in place. And none of this has to be too pretty. Just kind of crank it down, make sure it's not going to go anywhere. I always save the ends of my 
the other ends of my marabou because you never know what they can be used for. They always come in handy for something. So I'll come in and with the, these tails I usually add two pieces. You can add more but proportions are really the key to tying flies. You don't want to have too much, you don't want to have too little. So I'll tie, I'll tie in two pieces and I'll line up the tips of the feathers together and then pinch with my other hand and spread it just a little bit around that hook. And As I said before, a couple light wraps. Make sure everything's where you want it to be. Pull back on it and then give it some cranks. And I like using this 210 denier thread because I can really wrench on it. Make sure everything is secure as possible. Save that piece for later and tie in the rest of this so it's not flapping around and getting in my way for the next step. So, once we're there, we've got our, our two pieces of marabou looking good off the tail. Then I'll take a maybe about a little over an inch, inch and a half. And you can go a little bit more, a little bit less. It depends on how much of this UV polar chenille you want to you want to use. But it, you know, it also adds a little bulk to the body, not only just flash, it adds some substance to the body to make it more of a consistent profile when it's wet. So I'll take the end, tie it into the, the back of the hook, just the very tip there. Give it a couple really tight wraps. It doesn't take much to keep that in place. Then I'll work the thread all the way back up to, the, to just behind the eye. Then making sure it's straight and not twisted, because this UV polar chenille can twist on you. Make sure it's not twisted. Give a good sturdy pinch to the very end of it. And I like to use these rotary vices from Regal. So I just kind of give it a twist with my rotary vise. And you can make it as tight or as, as spread out as you want to wrap that puppy all the way up to the top. The tighter it is, the more bulk they'll be. Then I, while securing it with some pressure on my right finger, I'll pull back all the material with my left and there's always a little bit that stays straggled in the front but no big deal give it some wraps secure it in then come back up and pull everything back while tying in the rest of what you got and I usually tie it back you know tie it back you know quarter of an inch back because I'm going to be placing another piece of marabou right on top of this and as I said, none of this has to look too pretty. Just keep it consistent, keep it classy. And then before I was talking about the different types of marabou that you get in a package. Right here is a good, a good explanation of the differences. This kind of is more spread out and the tip of it has very strong fibers so it almost it almost looks like a tail when you're looking at it from from just straight out of the package and this piece is a little more fluffy it just feels like it has like a little more down to it a little more puff and I like to use these pieces for the bellies and the backs of these dragons because it just you know one piece you, like one piece of the marabou seems to go further than than those more spread out pieces that we were using for the tail. So I'll take this tip and I put it at the pretty much right at the eye of the hook and I want to make sure that it covers just about just past where all that UV chenille goes. You know I like my flies flashy but not too flashy so I kind of disguise it a little bit with these pieces of marabou. So I pop it in there right below the uh, eye of the hook and then with my left hand I spread it just around the hook shank. And then I tie it in. Again, my first couple wraps are a little loose. Just want to make sure it's spread around that hook nice. Still holding it in place. And then I'll give it a couple more heavy duty wraps with 
that thread. And you know, while you're in this process and you're, you might be new to it or you might not be as confident in it, you just check to make sure you're not too close to that eye. It doesn't really matter. You can't be too, I mean, you don't want to be in the middle of the hook, but you don't want to be right, right behind the eye because then you can't get your connective material to make it articulated. It's hard to get it into that eye at that point. So from there, I just cut it, save that piece of marabou, pull everything back with my left hand, and then work my way forward, securing everything else down and making it look smooth and flush. Then I'll flip it over, give it a couple whip finishes, either three or four, whatever you like. And I usually do it twice just because I like to really ensure that my flies stay together 100%. There won't be any problems with it. There, try to build them, build them to last as long as they can. So a couple whip finishes and then there we go. This is the tail of the dragon, the dragon tail. Most of the time I'll take a little bit of this uh, zap a gap and just hit it real quick. But I think this one's secure enough and we're gonna go straight to tying it so I won't have enough time to let that glue heal. So onto the head of the fly. Using a size two stinger hook. So this is a little bit bigger. Lately, since I moved over here to Norway, I'm not fishing as much of these big size two hooks. The fish don't seem to like really big streamers as much as they did back on the Yellowstone. So these size two hooks I haven't been using as much. I've been I've been knocking it down to a size four and a size six for a tail. So size four for the head, size two for the tail instead of this size, or size six for the tail instead of this size two. And you know, this this is kind of this is the way I first started tying them. This is the way that Umqua ties them with these bigger size two hooks and they just you know they they're sturdy and they're they're as i as i build my flies the same as i build my flies i build them to last and this these hooks you can just resharpen over and over again if you get caught on a log or a rock you can just take a file to it and get it sharp again in just a matter of seconds so same as before just wrap that thread start from behind the eye work your way all the way down to just before the curve the hook and you know sometimes I'll cut off that extra little piece but most of the time I can just tie it in I mean a little extra thread doesn't doesn't hurt anybody and I mean everyone has their own preference for putting a certain amount of thread on a hook I like to not see any chrome I like to cover that hook with enough thread that it's not gonna nothing's gonna go anywhere once once you put it on there it's gonna stick to it and so with these dumbbell eyes before we start putting these on I like to build up a little middle section for where I place them just so there's a little bit more for them to grab onto so they don't rotate or spin on the hook and you know some people will put the the eyes of the hook right behind the eye I like to stick them, you know, maybe a half an inch, half an inch behind. You know, a little more than a quarter, a little less than a half, just so I can build up the head on the rest of that hook with that Arctic fox. And I tend to fish a lot of my hooks up, so the eyes will be face down, just so I don't get caught up on the bottom as much. I like to swing these flies just as much as I like to strip them. So it adds a little more versatility and not losing as many of these big flies as much. So, And, you know, as I said, I like to really reinforce all of my material on this fly. So it's, once you place it, you set it and forget it. It's not gonna move. Some people do just figure eights the whole way. I do multiple wraps in a figure eight form so these eyes don't twist. I don't glue them in or anything like that. Less glue, the better, in my opinion. So I just really, you know, make sure they're they're nice, they're nice and in there. 
And it's hard to get these eyes to always sit perfectly. One of them leans a little to the right or to the left always. It's hard to get them perfectly flush. So I build up a good amount of thread on there just to make sure they're not going anyplace. Then work that thread all the way back to the curve of the hook and we'll get the tail ready with our articulation connector and the beads. So some people like to use like a metal wire or even like thick mono to connect a fly for articulation. I really like to use this 80 pound uh, braided backing. The first time I ever tied this fly, I didn't have any articulation material at the bar when I was bartending, just messing around, figuring stuff out and kind of trying different things. So I used some 20 pound backing that I had and the next day I went and fished the fly and it had an amazing, amazing movement under the water. It wasn't just locked into going back and forth. It had more of a serpent feel, more of an actual fishy feel. So I've been using this ever since. And this 80 pound backing is extremely, extremely strong, very durable. I've had people fish these flies for striped bass that get over 30 pounds and never have had a problem on it. Earlier this year, I caught a 20 pound pike on a black version of this fly and it held up great. No problems with it at all. The only problem is sometimes getting this this material through the eye of the hook. So I slightly wet it down and put it right through the center of that puppy. That one gave me no issues at all. So while putting the beads on these, I kind of put them in tandem. So you're not trying to get two pieces of this thread through one, one of the little holes of the beads, so you do it one at a time. And with this particular fly, we're gonna be using three separate beads. One of these cream miracle beads, kinda, oh, they call them 3D beads, but you can find them all over the place and they're sometimes called 3D beads or miracle beads. So get your thread dialed in, your backing, your connective, t uh, connective material, whatever you use, and thread those puppies in. And so, funny thing about these skulls that I use, I was shopping at a Joann's Fabrics back in Bozeman, Montana in 2012, and I was just looking for, for some good beads, and I came across these and they're made of um, sometimes pewter, sometimes just, you know, copper or whatever. These are, they add a little bit of weight, but they're also just, you know, at, at the beginning when I first started doing it, it was just more of a, a way to pimp my ride and make it, make the fly kind of my own. So if anybody bought my flies or were using my flies, they know where they came from. And they add a little bit of extra weight because as I was saying earlier, these flies are a little more buoyant with all that fox fur and marabou so they don't sink as fast as others. So this just adds a little bit more weight. It adds a little bit of sound when they click together and it helps the whole fly sink at a better speed than just up to down. The whole thing kind of sinks, helps the body get down there. And sometimes, you know, I've got a bunch of different colors of these 3D beads. Sometimes I'll use a, a cream or a gray one and then add a little red for a little wounded bait fish glow in the belly there. And then after I get all my beads on, just like so, I will check. I'll pull the beads forward a little bit and make sure that this backing isn't spun on itself because that will make the fly twist a little bit while you're stripping it or fishing it. So I make sure that the backing is pretty flush. And you should do that with your metal metal wire or anything that you really use for a for a backing connector or a uh, articulated connector. So I put that in right at the right at the end of the curve of the hook, right at the beginning of the curve of the hook there. And then I figure out my spacing. 
it's usually like in between a quarter and a half an inch away that I want to tie it in. And that gives this a little bit of play. I mean, I've only had, had a hook, can, like hook into this backing material like once or twice out of almost 10 years of fishing these. So it's never, never really been a big problem. So I'll, I'll tie it in loose, just get everything dialed in and make sure that that, that articulation material is just right on that curve. Cause you don't want it to be way down here. So it's right behind the hook. Then it'll wrap around the front hook more often than not. I want to put that that connective material right here on the back. And again, with that 210 denier, I really wrenched down on it. I cranked down on this super hard, so there's never ever a worry about a slip. And other things you can do with either metal, mono, or this backing material, is you can take one end of it, separate the two pieces, and tie one in at a time. Once you get to the end of it, just like that, and then I'll force that push that back over and tie that in so there's even less likelihood of anything slipping or popping loose. And I'm not too shy with my thread. I don't mind giving it a few extra wraps just to make sure everything's gonna stay nice and secure. So we've got the tail hook locked in, back hook facing up as well, top hook facing up, and grab some more of that UV polar chenille silver. And you can use anything you like. Sometimes I, I mix and match. Sometimes I just go straight copper because I love this copper UV polar chenille. But the way that I've made these for the public and sold them at a few different fly shops, I've always gone just, you know, pretty solid colors and consistent colors. And I keep the uh, color combos to myself. Secret stash. So just grab the tip of that UV polar chenille, put it right there at the very back, and crank it in. Just wrap that sucker all the way in. Then I'll bring my thread all the way up from, from the back to the, the front of the eyes. Get a hold of that UV polar chenille. Yet again, making sure it's not twisted or there's any problems with it. You'll want to wrap it in when it's all twisted up. You can kind of pull some of that material back if it's messing with you. And then I'll just use this rotary vise to spin it on. And as I said before, you can use more or less depending on how bulky you want this fly to look. So place it in, pull as much of it back as I can, and give it a couple wraps just to, just to secure it. Then I'll come over and Pull everything back real well and crank down on it just to make sure everything's locked and loaded. Leaving it again like another little more than a quarter inch back behind the eyes because you're going to place a couple pieces of marabou top and bottom. Okay, UV polar chenille is locked in. Now to pick a couple good pieces of marabou. stick in there and I'll usually take two pieces for the underbelly just because most of the time that's what the fish are seeing they're looking up they want to see that white belly and sometimes I do color combos with these streamers I'll do you know a piece of cream marabou and another piece of yellow on top of it so they kind of blend well but for the most part, these solid colors I've never had any problem with, and they seem to come out pretty good. The fish don't mind it. So I'll place that just past the UV polar chenille and just at the tip of the tail hook so they blend together. I don't want to have it too long. So, you know, if the marabou's too long, it can move a little separately from the from the fly when you're swimming it. So I like to have it just covering that middle body, middle section there. That's a little too long. The thing that I've noticed with tying flies, the most important thing is proportions. You gotta have the right proportions. If you're using too much or too little, it just doesn't work. 
So got got the right amount, the right length. And again, I use my, my fingers to kind of curl it around the hook before I tie it in. And then I tie it in a couple, three wraps, but pretty loose. And just make sure if I need to, I can shimmy it around that hook. And then I'll give it a couple cranks just to lock it in nice and strong. Trim that puppy, save it for later. Take another piece. Most of the time I just do two. Two on the belly and maybe one on the head. The hook or the eyes are, are pointed down anyway, so the belly's gonna sink. But I do like to have this fly fairly buoyant, so if I swing it, it kind of hovers in the zone and doesn't go straight to the bottom. It gives me the opportunity to play the from the bank down to the bottom without it just sinking straight away. And I can play a couple different levels of depth, a couple, couple different angles to swing it at. So there's my two pieces of marabou on the belly. Just crank that in real good. Pull all that excess marabou back. Now we're locked in. And then for the, uh, the top piece on the back, I'm picking this piece. It's a little bit thicker than, than the two I used for the belly, but still not thick. Thick as using two pieces. So kind of pinch that, figure out the way I want it to lay, get my placement, pull the tail back so I can kind of judge the placement and make sure that the tips of the marabou are just a little bit past the eye of the, the back hook. Spread it out over that hook again around the back using my fingertips right behind the eye and I crank it in. Sometimes I need to use two pieces of marabou if I'm if I'm cranking out a couple dozen flies a day. I need to. I don't want to waste too much time picking out the the right pieces for for each one. And I, I have two that look good, or just one that looks good. I'll just stick with one piece, and it's no problem. I'll give that a couple more cranks, not being shy with the thread. Then we'll move over to the flash that I use the, for the lateral line, the lateral flash. And I use, I use this stuff called mirror crinkle flash. And you can use, you can use anything that you like. I mean, it all works, but I really like this stuff because it has almost like a scale, a scaly texture to it. And the, it just, it catches the fisherman more than the fish. I think it, it doesn't really matter what kind of flash you use, but I really like this stuff. So, and I'll take, I'll pull out one strand and I'll cut it in half and use two, one on, two on each side. So they'll be four in total. And this stuff we're using is a uh, mirror crinkle flash pink, but it has almost like a, a blue, purple, pink look to it. So it, it kind of looks like the side of a white fish when you get up close to them. So I'll curl that, double it over, cut it once, then I have two pieces. I'll take the two pieces that are approximately the same length, kind of bring them together, and hold them similar to that with my fingers. And I'll come in underneath the eye, hooks facing up, right behind the eye, <clears throat> right in front of the eye, pull them back behind the eye, and give it you know, two, two or three wraps, whatever, but you want to, you want to tie it in pretty loose. So you have the ability, if they're not flush, you can kind of move them up or down to get them to be at the right length, equal length on each side. Then I pull them down. So they're facing sideways on the side of the hook. And then they're good to go. Pull pull everything back and just give it a couple secure wraps. Now, we're, now this fly is starting to take shape. And there's really only a couple more pieces to the puzzle that we have to work in. So I used to do a lot of dubbing loops with fox fur 
and it can be kind of a pain in the ass and a little more time consuming than buying these fox fur brushes. And there's a variety of companies that use them. Go to your local fly shop, look at a hairline, and you'll find what you're looking for. And these are really good because they're thin, they're not too bulky. I've definitely gone through the trial and error phase using too much or too little. And when it comes to this Arctic Fox, it seems like less is more. So I take a whole brush and I cut it in half. And that's what this is. This is a half of a brush and it just seems to work perfectly. Sometimes I might need a little bit more, but at the very end, I usually take a pinch and stack some in just at the tip of the nose to make everything look fine and dandy. Okay, so I take the end of this Arctic Fox brush and I, you know, the hooks are going to be swimming up on this fly. So I flip it over, I go to the underside, under its belly, under its neck, and I tie it in right behind the eyes. And again, I crank this puppy in. I really set this material in strong, give it a couple really heavy duty cranks. And then I bring it up to the nose just to double secure that this thing doesn't slide or move or anything. And then I'll even do a wrap diagonally around the eyes to make sure I, I over set my material purposely just so no one can complain and there's no problems. I snipped a little piece of metal off there with a shitty pair of scissors or a not so desirable pair of scissors. And then that metal wire, the end of that metal wire can stick up and cause problems. If I wasn't to trim it and then push it down, it might break my thread as I wrap it. So I kind of use my thumbnail to push it down and make sure it's even. And then I do some light wraps around the end of that piece of metal. And then I kind of just cover it up real quick. Bringing my thread all the way up to the, right behind the eye of the hook, I get a hold of this Arctic Fox, Fox brush just with the tips of my fingers. I pinch it pretty tight. And then I start to pull this material backwards wrapping it away from me, <clears throat> away from me on this hook, right, right in front of that marabou, making sure all the materials pushed back. And as I start to wrap it away from me, I use my fingers to curl the rest of that Arctic Fox backwards. You don't wanna wrap all the Arctic Fox over it in a big pile and not have it, have it do its job. So the whole time while I'm wrapping, I'm using my fingers to manipulate that Arctic Fox fur backwards. And so we've already done almost two wraps all the way around. And for the most part, I do about two to two and a half wraps all the way around, just behind the eyes. There doesn't need to be much material right behind the eyes. So once, once I do those two nice wraps, keeping tension the whole time on it, because you want it to be tight, you don't want it to move around after you, you start fishing it, I bring it and I put it in between the eyes at a, at a diagonal angle, pulling that material back, pinching, using pressure, and I bring it right in front of the eyes and continue wrapping it while manipulating that material backwards. This can be a pain in the neck when you're first starting to do it, but once you kind of get the hang of it, it's not too bad. Sometimes in the middle of wrapping this fly like this one's doing, the material might get knotted together, kind of junked up. So I'll take this bobbin or bobkin, sorry, and I'll just kind of pluck everything out, making it look good. Get all that straightened out. All right. And then I'll use my fingers to kind of comb everything back. And again, Continue manipulating that fox fur back on that brush and wrapping away from you. And, you know, I'll stack, I'll do like two or three wraps, maybe one twist, so it's wrapped three times. Then I'll pinch it down, I'll, I'll pick it out again, just 
because a little bit got a little chunked up right there. Pick it out as much as you want. It doesn't have to be too much. You're going to do it again at the end. Push everything back with your fingers. Make it all look good. All right, folks, had some technical difficulties. Had to switch out the battery real quick. But all I did was make one final wrap with the Arctic Fox, trim off the remaining piece of this uh, foxy brush, and there was a little piece of metal sticking up that I pushed down with my thumb because if you leave that hanging up and continue to wrap, it could cut the thread and give you a complete cluster of problems. So this is pretty much that one half of the uh, foxy brush two wraps or two and a half wraps behind the eyes and then about two wraps in front of the eyes and that adds a pretty um pretty good bulky beefy head to it but it's just not bulky enough for what i usually tend to like after you fish it once or twice the fur the fox hair gets kind of dulled down and pushed down so i will take the remaining pieces of arctic fox and i'll just straight pinch it off that brush pinch it and then I will kind of manipulate it into a nice last little chunk and that chunk I will I will take and pull all the excess out kind of brush it with my fingers and make it look nice and flush and I'll take that and I'll lay it right in between the eyes on the top of the fly and I only use the very tip of the fox fur you don't have to use all of it and the lower down you go the bulkier it gets anyway so I like to use the tip of it and I'll spread it out and comb it with my fingers lay it down right on the tip of that fly securing it with my fingers giving it a couple loose thre uh, thread wraps move it around with the tip of my thumb and then really secure it down now that adds a little extra bulk just to the front of the front of the fly. And I'll snip it down. Another reason why I do this is because I designed this fly to really push water. I used to fish mainly on the Yellowstone River, and that river can be two feet of visibility or two inches of visibility, depending on what time of year you're fishing and what the clarity is doing. So the fish aren't always hunting by sight, but by feel using their spidey sense to kind of distinguish where the, where the bait fish are and what's moving, moving past them. So I, I pinched off a little bit and put some on the very top. Now for the bottom, you know, and just wrapping it, wrapping that Arctic Fox once or twice in front of the eyes still makes it somewhat sparse. So it's not as bulky as you want. Like you can almost see through the back or the bottom part here. So it's, it, it kind of looks like uh, it's semi balding. So taking that extra clump and just placing it on the top and bottom, really give it that extra beef you're looking for. So I'll take just the tip, just the tips. I'm not using this back end that's really thick. Just the tips to kind of cover up any problems. And I'll secure it with my fingers before I tie it in. And then a couple loose wraps. Kind of angling the tip of the bobbin back towards the eyes so it catches everything. And then, as I said, it's loose so I can still manipulate it with my thumb a little bit. And I'll curve it around and flatten it out so it's not in one big pile. And then I'll really wrench it down a few times. Now that's looking good. I'll take my handy scissors here and snip it down as close as I can. Pulling everything back. And this also gives it a really fishy look. You know, and it's not, you know, I, I wrap that Arctic Fox in a circle, but then stacking it makes it more wide top to bottom, making it look more like a white fish or a bait fish and you can do it in different ways to make it look a little bit more like a sculpin or use less material to make it kind of a, a thinner profile. I tie these in a variety of different profiles 
depending on how much water I'm looking to push and how much movement I want this to have under the water for the fish to feel. So here we are at the very end of the fly. This is looking good and I'll just take, take my whip finisher and just do a couple finishing knots. Just whip out a few just to keep everything secured, locked in and loaded. Three there and then another three. You can't go wrong doing a couple extra, it's no big deal. Cinch it down, pull it tight. Take the scissors, cut it tight. And then this is kind of this is kind of the final process I've I've been doing the last couple years with this just to kind of clean up that nose, add a little extra flair, a little extra color to it. I'll take some Zappa Gap, some glue, and I'll take some UV ice dub tan. Just a little pinch, a little dab will do ya. And I make a little dreadlock. I just spin it in my fingers, no big deal. It doesn't have to look pretty. You don't want to use too much, less is more. And we're just going to be tying this in around the eye, around the nose, kind of bulk it up and to pretty it up a little bit. But either way, you can use it or lose it. It's still going to work. The fly is still deadly effective with or without it. I'll take my bobkin and just spread it, spread that around, make sure I hit all the surfaces. And I, I glue this anyway just to secure everything at the end, even if I wasn't using that UV ice tub. So we're good to go there. I take my little dreadlock and I'll just wrap it a few times, pulling off any excess I don't need. It doesn't have to look pretty. And then what I do is I take my fingers while pushing back towards the eyes, I just spin a few times. And that secures it to that glue and also pushes it back away from the eye of the hook so there's no material getting in your way of putting your tippet on. And that glue chemically bonds to that ice stub, locks everything in. And if there's any problem at the end, like a little piece that you don't want, there's usually a little leftover glue on my bobkin that I can kind of just brush any pieces that are hanging, hanging low off. And then again, I'll just give it a quick spin. The final process to this fly is taking those barbs and just laying them flat. Get those barbs out of the way. Knock those barbs off. Then I'll pull everything back straight, try not to hook myself, and just see how that UV mirror flash, or sorry, the, the mirror crinkle flash is sitting. I'll get rid of all that marabou, push it over, pull everything nice and tight. And just make sure my mirror crinkle flash is all sitting pretty even. And I'll just trim it even because I'm a stickler. This is a bulky, buoyant fly, but once it gets wet, it lays down. At first, you might feel like it's casting a wet sock. But once you, once you put some time into fishing it, you realize that it ain't that bad. And I designed this fly not to strip it a ton, but to swing it, let the current take it. And it gives it such a natural serpent movement. It's not just locked into doing this or that. 
the tail moves like a fish or like a water snake. So there you have it, folks. The Cream Dragon original.